Well, hello there. My God. Technology. Ay, ay, ay. You'd think it would be a lot easier, but whatever. We're here. I'm with Ted Robinson, the great broadcast. I would call you a virtuoso, a, a relative bait. I know. You, you, I yeah. know. See, I yeah. thought I would annoy you right off the start. Yeah. But no, well, no, I mean, these are the things my kids have laughed at for decades when they hear people say things like that. <laughs> That's why you have kids. They laugh at you. You know, I've often said, I consider you old school, even though you're not old. And I'm not old. I mean, I'm, you know, I guess in this world today, I grew up with old school genre, ambiance, right? So I, I, I place that in not just, you know, sports, broadcast, culture, music, food, like Ted. Robinson, I'll get to the formal introduction in a second. I still like a good beef tongue sandwich. Now, that's not this, right? We're garden salads and tofu and alfalfa sprouts. I like a good tongue. And you're lat. No, you're rich. Coast, because right? rich, what you have to have with that sandwich is a knish. <laughs> a knish. Yeah. And maybe a little seltzer, a little egg cream, too. Yeah, well, egg cream, wow. Egg cream is one of the great, I'm a New Yorker, as many may know, and egg cream is one of the great uh, inventions because as a kid, I used to be able to walk down and every so often my mother would give me a quarter, 50 cents or whatever, I could walk down to the corner soda fountain in the right. little town, or not the little town, this suburban New York town I grew up in, and we could order an egg cream. And what is hysterical about that is it has neither egg nor cream in it. Right. I have no idea how the name came it about. Sounds good, right? It has neither egg nor cream. <laughs> right. And I'm not even from the East Coast, but I've been back there enough. But my late mother, as you know, was from Brooklyn. And, you know, I the hot dogs, the bagels taste better, even though they're okay out here now yeah. because of the water, right? And and I, I you ought to have been named Ted Robinstein. <laughs> or Ted, because you're about as you're more Jewish in some respects. Well, I'm honorary. I mean, look, I I went to yes. probably I probably went to a dozen bar mitzvahs in my 13th year, and actually my closest friend through much of my childhood, and the best man at my wedding at the Basilica at the University of Notre Dame was Michael yeah. Feldman. So, yes, well known Jewish university, right? Of course. And behind me is, by the way, behind me is the yeah. that I received from the Northern right. California right. Jewish Sports right. Hall of Fame right. a year. Ago. Well, you know what they say, Ted? Catholics are Jews that go to church on Sunday. And Jews <laughs> are Catholics that go to church on Saturday. Right. I just made that up. But it's right, right? Catholics are very similar. The food, family, the hot dogs, the 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 ambiance, all that stuff, right? I feel like I'm Larry King now, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. It's a suspender. It's all you need is suspenders. I got wow, well, yeah. And then Sharon Stone could come in the studio and she can. <laughs> You remember that story? Yes. All right. Formal introduction. Get that out of the way. Um, Ted Robinson. I'm just going to do this off the top of my head because I feel like I didn't have to do that much research because I've known you for years. Uh, although anybody before. watching this knows who I am. So don't uh, okay. I know. I, well, thank you. Yeah. Hello there. Be no, a little hungry. I mean, if somebody's but taking I remember time to you. click this on, they know who I am. I Of course. Yeah. And you don't even have to say, do you know who I am? I know. I, I know you obviously from the 49ers, the Warriors, the Giants, the uh my God, you've done it all. I mean, right? You've and you were were you not with the Giants in the when they in, in the 2001 trip when they were in Houston? Yeah. I called, I, I called, were. I had a chance, uh, it was a great thrill. I called um Barry Bond's 70th home yes. in Houston. In Houston. Which was, I think. That and the JT Snow home run in the 2000 playoffs against the Mets are the two calls I'm proudest of in my Giants time. Mm -hmm. Just in terms of, you feel like I said, announcer, you feel like you nailed the call. And the Bonds one was amazing because the, it was post 9 11, delayed right. series. And Houston was also in the playoff chase along with the Giants. And so Houston walked Barry like nine or 10 times in three games. And they yeah, finally pitched that. to him the final at bat of the final game. They right. had a young young kid came in to pitch because the Giants were blowing him out. He pitched to Barry, and Barry had basically one swing in three games, and he hit the ball in the second deck. It right, was, I remember that very vividly. In fact, it's isn't it insane, Ted, that it's now what twenty 
three, well, almost 23 years since all of that. And okay. I, it's like, it's like a cliche. I always say this to say, God, it feels like yesterday. It doesn't feel like yesterday, but it doesn't, it doesn't feel like 23 years. Right. Yeah. I tell this story, uh, Rich, about 2001. That's the last one I'll tell you is that um, late in that season, uh, we we're, we we're playing in San Diego mm -hmm. and I had become professionally friendly with Tony Gwynn because we played the Padres 19 times a year. Tony Gwynn was incredibly great. He was one of the greatest interviews I've ever had in sport. Yeah, so guy. after nine years of pregame interviews with him, Tony knows me. So we're at the batting cage uh -huh. in San Diego in September of that year. And Tony Gwynn comes over to say, hello, we're talking. And he goes, Ted, how many uh, bats has Barry Bonds broken this year? And I said, well, you know, maybe one, but you know, Tony, Barry never breaks bats. He goes, how many times has Barry checked his swing this year? I said, oh, man, I can't think of it. One or two, maybe. He goes, Ted, you know, I've pretty good hitter. He goes, yeah, he goes, I've never watched someone who has seen the ball better than Barry Bonds is seeing it this year. And of course, we later found out through yeah. Mark Fainer Wada. Uh, and Steve Fainer's work that one of the offshoots of HGH, I say. I cite and yeah. So I've never yeah, forgotten that's... that conversation, Tony yeah. Gwynn, what that comment that Tony Gwynn, one of the greatest hitters, not power hitters, but one of the greatest pure hitters in baseball history, said to me about Barry in September of the year he hit 73. Do you still think, as long as we're quickly on that subject, because I don't want to talk about that, but do you think he's going to eventually make the Hall of Fame, or is that... I, I think, and it might be after our lifetime, but yes, I think he will. At some point, unlike, we have to acknowledge. What about Pete Rose? Pete Rose. I think Pete Rose will not get in until he passes away because Pete Rose will right. never say the one thing he did already if he had just said, I'm sorry. And Pete Rose appears to be incapable of saying, I'm sorry. You know, isn't that I've always marveled in a negative way, in a kind of a holy, you know what, the baseball's most prolific hitter, Pete Rose, baseball's most prolific home run hitter, with even with an asterisk, Barry Bonds, and they're both not in the Hall of Fame. And I'm not saying they should be necessarily, but when your sport has that kind of distinction, isn't that kind of... Uh... You know, it's funny, I interviewed Reggie Jackson. The last year Reggie played, I was the A's announcer in 1987. I did the A's television that right. Year. Bill came to Ron Simmons. So I was 40 games or whatever it was. But anyway, so I you know, was around Reggie enough and interviewed him, I think, before a game one day. And he mentioned something I've never forgotten. He said, you know, you can break your bat and get a base hit. You know, you can hit a nine chopper, nine hopper to shortstop and beat it out for a hit. You can bloop hits and you can get a lot hits a lot of different ways. He says, you can't break your bat. Well, it's been disproven a few times. Oh, but you can't, basically, you can't hit a broken bat home run. And Reggie was trying to differentiate between, at that time, the milestone, which was 500 home runs, and what Pete Rose had done, oh. which was 4,000-plus hits. Of course, 3,000 was the bar forever in baseball. Right. I've right. always remembered that, that Reggie tried to differentiate between right. hits. Because Reggie, yeah. And a very runs. humble man, Reggie, right? Well, of course. But, I mean, it was an interesting yeah. thing to think about. <laughs> no, you're right. Well, I remember when, you know, I remember when 300 home runs – was kind of like, you know, like, five, you know, or 400. I mean, like, otherwise, you know, so, Dave Kingman, right? He'd be uh, in the So, Rich, I worked, when I went to the Mets, I spent four years, and I did some work with Ralph Kiner, who, of course, I grew mm -hmm. up with, and Ralph was a fabulous man. But Ralph's Hall of Famer, and he has three, I think, 360-some-odd home runs in his career. So that, by modern standards, pales, right? Right. But Ralph let me know one night at dinner that the day he retired from baseball, he mm -hmm. was sixth on the all-time home run list. Hall of Fame. Jeez. In his time, in his era, he was a dominant power hitter. But that's yeah. amazing. And, and the day he retired, he was sixth on the all-time home run list. Wow. That's in nowadays, it's like uh yeah, I don't I don't know. Well, I don't want to get off on baseball. I want to talk about your career and the fact that uh um I mean you've done a lot of, of, I mean, you're about to go to Paris, poor fella, in the summertime and do your, what is this, your 14th Olympics? And and that's, and by the way, you're going to go to Paris. So, you know, yes. are you, say, have you been to Paris before? Pending, pending NBC's announcement, I expect to. 
do that. I got you. All right. What are they going to do? You're going to pick uh, <laughs> Steve Schmuck or something? Of course you're going there. If you go, when you go, are you going to be doing uh, just any sport? Are you going to do – I mean – Well, the sport I've done uh, since the Athens Olympics, which is 20 years ago now, uh, the sport I've been on is diving, so I would expect that's the diving. one I'll be, uh, I'll be assigned to again. And just for people that, so you go, I'm not, I'm talking in general now as an announcer, they have the, I mean, I imagine for this, it's going to be humongous because it's summertime and it's also the fact that it's the first Olympics post pandemic, but in a relative sense. So you go there, you have credentials and I, do you have like a setup or you have a, I mean, you're staying there, but what is it like? I mean, just give us like a function of what it's well, like. Okay. I'll be brief here. The Olympics have changed. And part of it is due to technology, which was accelerated by COVID. So it's all connected. Um, that now so much of international sport is done remotely. And it's just money. It's no, right. no, nothing more than that. But the technology is so good that it allows this mm -hmm. to be done with a minimal, if any, loss of what you gain by being there. Now, as an announcer, I can't stand saying that. But I've lived it. It's true. I right. can't deny it. So uh, my expectation is that uh, being in Paris this summer, you may have announcers there. You probably won't have a lot of production people there. Most of the production will come from uh, well, NBC. The cost is obvious. The first headquarters reporter. in Stanford, Connecticut, suburban New York. Yeah, Connecticut. Uh, right. Uh, and they've done this before and it works well. And it saves uh, them a lot of money, which in, in broadcast like, lingo today. Hello. And, and, you know, it's also part of it. Part of this started in Beijing in 2008. When right. the Chinese government, at the, uh, remember, the, we're talking 16 years ago, the Chinese government was still in the process of opening up the country. And they we were trying to limit the number of people that were coming in. They were limiting the number of visas. And uh, so, therefore, there was some something of a limit of a cap so to speak put on people like nbc you can only bring 2500 instead of 3500 and they went down the line with all those sorts of things so that's carried through to this day because of all the security issues the cost issues yeah. the, the jamming up of the cities uh, you know now that we're back in major cities for the olympics you know the infrastructure can only handle so much so my expectation will be in paris this summer there will be the sports that will have announcers there um, we'll probably not have many production people there. Right. And generally, in Olympic television, the Summer Olympics, there is a there's a top three: swimming, track and field, track and, and field. Gymnastics. gymnastics. Those are the three dominant sports. Right. Those three pretty much get the full on traditional television. Yeah. And the, of course, the opening ceremony had the, the of course yeah. opening and closing and, and the closing and, and right. Bob Costas right. and Mike Tirico is going right. to be there with a full studio contingent, no question about that. But every other sport and, and diving that I've been involved with, diving has been in the second tier where we might be there, but there's going to be limited production people. And then you'll go down another couple of tiers to the you know the the the, the, the rowings and the archeries and the table right, tables right, right. that are all going to come from Stanford, Connecticut. Be Did no you mention swimming too, Ted? Yes, swimming's swimming is one of the yeah. big three. Swimming is swimming, gymnastics, and track and field are the yeah. big three of the summer Olympics. I just saw an article. You want to feel a little old, not old, old, but Mark Spitz is 70. What was it? 75 years old. Is that right? And, yeah. And and of course, I think back, God forbid, this of course, but in this world today. I was 10 years old in 1972, and Mark Spitz is doing his thing, and I can never forget. You know, the picture with all the gold. He got, what, seven gold medals. He's it, It's the story of the Olympics, the basketball, that, well, Spitz. And then we have September 5th, 1972, the tragedy of the Israeli athletes being murdered. And, you know, I still think, I cannot believe, and I'm not the only one, they didn't stop at the Olympics well, at that point. It's 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 the most shameful, I, I think it's the yeah, most Avery in the history of the Olympics is that, they were allowed to continue. No continue, yeah. But I think back to that, and I think of Mark Spitz, and I still, I think he's, he, he was from Sacramento, right? And he was a dentist, or he was going to be a dentist. But I think about that, and the fact that I heard 74, and I go, oh my God. Yeah. Talk about bringing back memories. So, okay, the Olympics, uh, but you've done other things. Obviously, you did the Giants, you just mentioned. Quickly, are you, would you like to go back and be a, an ancillary broadcaster if the Giants were to inquire. I know 
that you like baseball, obviously. You broadcast for the Mets one time, I right? did 23 years of baseball, and it was in my blood. And, I'm, uh, you know, I've been out of touch with baseball for a little bit. The last year I did baseball at all was 2011. The Minnesota Twins brought me back. It was a transition year for them, and I came back as one of their former announcers. And I did about 30 or 35 games for the Twins that year. But that's 13 years ago now. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, I, at this point in life, uh, a full-time, uh, you know, 150, 160 baseball game thing is no And you had a little, uh, you had a little tension with Larry Bear, who runs the Giants in the business end, the, one of the big people, the big mishpuka, as my mother would say. But you've created, you guys are talking, you just had lunch with no, them. We're fine. Larry, and Larry's, you're, you're good friends with Larry. Well, Larry and I go, I mean, Larry and I, Larry hired me. Yeah. Larry's the guy that brought me back to California. Right. In 1993. I'm forever indebted for that. 1993 was my favorite year of my nine years with the Giants because it was like a like a newborn baby. The team was reborn, drawing amazing crowds to Candlestick. That was the year. If you remember, we played almost all day games that year. It was What's a pretty yeah. field like schedule. Right. Barry Bonds was new and was the best player in the league by a mile. And of course, the year ended in heartbreak. Right. That will never happen again. Solomon Torres. Right. Well, I mean, about to win 103 games and go home. Not, and not, yeah. That was never happened right. in the history of baseball again right. because of the wild card system. That was right. 93 was the last season without the wild card. And uh, that was Dusty Baker's first year, was oh, it? Oh, Dusty. Yeah, it was, it was Dusty. And it was, yeah. uh, it was, it was just a mad, it was magical. Magical. Everything yeah, that yeah. could no, go I remember right that. for a team that year did so for the Giants until the final day of the year. Yeah. No, I'll never forget that. So, so let, let's just kind of do a hopscotch all around because you're you you've done everything, broadcast wise. Um, you're part of Bay Area sports culture, and in my book, again, one of the best. And I say I've always said that, so I'm not kissing up to you. I've always maintained, um, and I grew up in an era, as you probably know, where we had. I mean, you had great New York announcers, in in and I know you spent time in. Uh, in Minnesota and you came to the Bay area. What was it back in 80? Was it 82? 1982. Uh, I came to KCBS radio. Right. I remember you and a guy named Mike Woodley and you worked at the, the, the station, the sports station in Minneapolis, I believe WCCO. So I worked at, uh, I worked at before here, I worked at KSTP radio in Minneapolis. And that's okay. where I met Mike. Mike was a, a producer Mm -hmm. or the talk show I was doing, I got hired in 82 to come to San Francisco. And then somewhere 87, maybe somewhere around there, uh, KCBS had a need and I really pushed hard and, and was able to get Mike hired and Mike moved out here. And then Mike stayed when I went back to Minnesota. Exactly. Was, right. I went back to be the twins announcer in uh, 1988 and Mike stayed out here for a little while. Let's I, I, I've saved the best for last because, you know, people look, we're not talking about uh, terminal diseases. We're not talking about nuclear war. We're talking about, you know, it's a kid's game. Bro. Yeah. I've always maintained and I will still maintain. And I've said so publicly, you know where I'm going, probably as far as the 49ers. Now, I loved you on the 49ers. You don't have to scream, not you, meaning you. You don't have to scream and yell. You, you know, again, I grew up with Bill King, Bill King, uh, Lon Simmons. Who could forget Lon's call of of, uh, of, of Jerry Rice or, uh, or uh, uh, Steve Young as he galloped down in the playoff games? You know, one of the greatest calls. Um, so I've always maintained, and I'll still maintain that, I don't know, I think he got screwed, but respectfully, with the 49ers. And now your life has gone on. What Can you tell us in a whatever way you can or will or want respectfully what the hell happened there yeah i don't know <laughs> i mean the the team made a decision they informed me of it there was no debate no conversation about it it was done and i don't know and it's it's in the but they but they they and i you're, you're being very deliciously diplomatic oh yeah uh, rich it's, but, rich it's I, five years ago i know it is i, I know but nobody nobody I, really knows ted nobody knows saying, what I, happened. I do not live with a rear view mirror well, i have 10 really terrific years but did, did you see that at all did you ever see that coming at all no i told you that when okay. well, well we're on people i've ever spoken to talking to an audience no, now, but, no. but they didn't know nobody really knows 
Uh, and do you have, I mean, um, how can I put this? Well, we'll, we'll move on. I, I, I don't want to put you in a position. I, I, Rich, Rich, I, what, I, what I want to say about it is I had 10 great years there. And uh, what gets lost is that of the 10 years I worked there, only three years did the 49ers win. And those are the hardball three, the, the three good hardball years. You're, yeah. Uh, and the rest of the years were not fun. I have five coaches in 10 years. Right. And believe me, I mean, I fully understood. I had, I had done some NFL radio for Westwood one before getting hired, but I'd never done a full NFL season. So I had to learn the NFL and I'm very proud of the fact I did that and worked my tail off to do so. Right. Over 10 years. And, uh, and I'm proud, I'm proud of that. And the fact that, you know, coaches respected me and people in the organization respected mm -hmm. that that's the most important part. The people I worked with, not broadcast people, but people in the organization. And I believe me, I heard, um, at the end, I heard from quite a few and, uh, and there was a moment, the last game I called was at the LA Coliseum. The Rams were still playing at the Coliseum. Right. And that was the last game I called. And I had, no, I knew going in, but no one else, in theory, no one else knew. And that was something I was very important important to me. But a couple of people knew, and one person in particular, I was sitting on the 49er bench during the warmups that day. And somebody significant came over and sat down and just said, I know what's going on, and it's wrong. Nothing, but nothing. That's, that's no, it's funny. done. It's done. But trust me, that, and I'm, I'm keeping that identity to myself gotcha but it is one of the most heartwarming things that i experienced because it was someone acknowledging what i felt clearly and <laughs> obviously i felt that way um, but it was someone else who had no horse in the race understanding and it doesn't change anything the outcome wasn't going to change but i i treasure those sorts of moments and i heard you know uh, you know they're, they're they're just some very special people in the 49er organization who reached out yeah, well, that's 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 good, and you you know you're a diplomat, and I I'm not asking you to burn a bridge or anything like that, but I understand. We'll move on. Any any uh, any sport that you haven't done, or for that matter, anything other than sports that you haven't done that you'd like to do? No, no, you know, I, there, there's two events I've never been to that I would at least one for sure. The Kentucky Derby. I've never been to the Derby. Okay. And, and I've never That's been to cool. the Indianapolis 500. I, I don't, I'm not an auto racing fan at all. My you son said, you said the Indianapolis and he is, he's manic about it. I'd love to just go experience it sometime. You know what I'd like to do since you brought up the, uh, the Indianapolis 500? Cause I've got these. Can I do this now for you? Oh. you don't want to go. Back home again. In India, okay, all right, or that, or don't don't, that. don't give people a reason to turn it off, Rich. Come on, lady. What was it? What's the one? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, start your. I love that. Yeah, I mean it's a ritual, and it's and yeah, I know it's a yeah. lot through my son-in-law. I mean it's a ritual and a tradition there, and it's it's it's. So I'd like to go once just to explain. I got you. No, no, no. Well, who's the, the what's the thing? Letterman's into that stuff, and then you know, and you mentioned the Derby. Oh, I God, talk about. It. Yeah. pomp and pageantry and the whole you know first saturday in may and all that but you i mean that's why when, you, when you talk i mean honestly talking about you know the, the the one or two bad experiences i've had are so minuscule compared to what i mean to be able to call wimbledon oh i've been there for well, i was gonna times. get to that to, i called the masters no can one, i tell you so no one remembers i know I the, the masters, masters yeah. in Hello, friends. to be there in butler cabin was unbelievable who gets a chance to do the thing so well, wimbledon and you know what though ted you you've done a billion like this is just a fan talking it doesn't feel like it's the same and maybe because they've enclosed it i used to as a kid watch it and you know, I always remember it had the the grass, and it was kind of orange grass. I guess that was from all the rain, and outdoors. And I knew it rained. I know they had to do that, but doesn't is it, am I the only one? It doesn't seem the same watching Wimbledon. Yeah, some some of the and the, and we don't have some a of this. Here. Some of this, Rich, I think, is based we 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 age and we change, and the things that the romantic nature of sport as we grow up and, and learn to embrace things we get to be wizened adults and and it's just different so i think like it's how you much said our 
yeah. vision and our place in life as much as the event change. Wimbledon, I'll be honest with you, Wimbledon, other than the covers, the roof covers on the right, two right, main right, courts, right. has not changed. Well, the, the, being there, being on the grounds, it has not changed. But the Americans, we don't have the kind of player. Well, we don't have uh, Mac. We don't have Johnny Mac and Jimmy Connors. And Connors, and but we don't even and, and, and even Pete. And yet, Pete won seven times. We don't have that. Yeah. Was uh, and I'm we're gonna go into the home stretch. Speaking of, but uh, Federer or the other guy who I forget, the uh, recent guy, uh, who's the greatest? Then, well, it's three. And oh, I, and all, I, I, I now differentiate this way when I get asked this question. The greatest player of all time is clearly Djokovic. His numbers are undeniable. Yeah, that's the, the guy. Best I've player played. I've ever seen is Roger. Yeah, Fett. yeah, and he's still playing. And no, and, Roger's not playing. Roger's done, and Roth is just about done. Novak is still playing. Right, right, right. And yet, women's game when we have a, we have the, a couple of players, uh, American, but again, I don't think. You have to have Americans to to make the game whole and all that. But you know what I'm saying? You you watch and you would like to have, you know, the Tracy Austins yeah. and the Tracy Everett. I mean Serena Everett, Venus. Yeah. That actually women's tent women's professional tennis in the United States is much better on the world stage in the last 15 years than the men have been. That's the, the it gets lost because of clearly Serena's dominance, but Venus and right. Lindsay get born and Jennifer Capriati. Right. Except we've had Martina Navratilova. Well, that's, she's not American, but I, if it had not for been for for uh, for Serena Navratilova, I mean, you talk about, I mean, amazing, right? You know that Martina, uh, Martina changed the sport. In her oh yeah, because she brought strength. It was you know Chrissy was the last graceful, you know, purely mm -hmm. feminine. You know, these are hard things to say today because people can misinterpret, but you know, that's the way the I game got you. always played. Martina yeah. brought strength and fitness and more power that has been magnified a thousand times by Serena Williams. <laughs> I mean, Serena's, that's why Serena's the greatest player of all. And you know what's great about, about Serena was the fact, and I saw this, I was there. Her sister was the one that her older sister thought. Wasn't it the case that tennis people, everybody thought that that Venus was going to be the star and that Serena just came along? Venus debuted in Oakland in 1993. Right. Well, Venus was first, but Richard, the father, always said it. Uh, and Serena, I, yeah. That Serena was going to be the one. Good, he he yeah. recognized Serena had something in her. Venus, Venus to this day, the best woman that I ever saw play at Wimbledon was Venus Williams. Venus Williams on the grass was better than Serena. Right, right, right. Uh, I remember Venus that. Venus didn't translate to hard courts or, or clay anywhere near as well as Serena did. But Venus on grass was spectacular. Quick, quick hits, and I know we got to go. Um, Tony Romo. Uh, I like Tony Romo. I like uh, NFL announcers. I know I, I like the guy, Ian, uh, Ian Eagle. Ian Eagle. He's still, There's another still, guy who doesn't go, you know, berserk and. No, uh, it's terrific. He's terrific. What do you think of Tony Romo? I mean, get a lot of flack. I don't um, know why, but you know, he's a little, you know, yeah. opinionated, and he's got a style. I think he's great, but. I mean, I think Tony Romo to me is the great story of the rookie pitcher in the Brook with the Brooklyn Dodgers in the 1950s, who won 20 games as a rookie. And had veterans come up to him and say, kid, you made a mistake. You should have stopped at 19. He goes, what do you mean? Because now they're going to expect you to win 20 every year. Right. That's Romo as an announcer. He he burst, comment, you know, predicting plays, whatever. And I, it's hard to live up to that. Um, I think Tony Romo's, to me, listening and knowing the other person I'm going to mention, knowing him, I think Tony Romo's great uh, uh contribution has been he has juiced up Jim Nance. I think he's brought oh, God. energy and yeah. energy that Jim probably is better off using being someone who's the same age as Jim. I can, I understand this concept. It's good. You know, and Jim and Phil Sims have been together a long time and maybe that change is a good thing because it juiced up Jim Nance. So. I, I like Phil Sims too, but I, I, yeah, hey, but I think that's mentioned. been, I think that's been Romo's great contribution. I'm, uh, mm -hmm. I'm, uh, you know, I'm much more in the Collinsworth Aikman 
yeah. stable in terms of in terms of the NFL ends. Yeah, I like Chris Collinsworth. I like uh, Aikman's kind of you know he's, but but I understand that, and I like Joe Buck. I'm not crazy, and I like the new the new Fox crew. You know, uh, Kevin yeah. Burkhart and the other guy Olson. He's a Olson's been very good too. I mean, he's very solid. There's nobody nobody gets to that level without being good. This is now becomes it becomes you know what flavor right. ice cream you want at Baskin Robbins old school analogy, but I mean that's truly what it is. I just there are um, my my uh, analysis whatever. Or, uh, I, I listen much more intently, let's say, mm-hmm. to the college football analysts because right. that's a sport I've been more involved with, especially in the mm-hmm. last five years. You know, even growing up, I it this is, has been stated, but not enough. Monday night football, they keep trying. I mean, I like, as I just said, I like Buck. I like, for the most part, Aikman. But Monday night football, you can't recreate that. That was not only the sports and Cosell and, you know, uh, Dandy Don and Gifford and all that. That happened by mistake. They didn't know that they were going to create this cultural phenomenon, right? And now they've tried. They brought in Dennis Miller. That was a disaster. And they've tried other things. Now they, I guess, they're going to sink or swim well, with Buck. But right? Yeah. Here, here's what I think about Monday Night Football. Very quickly, Monday Night Football. And again, I was a kid. You were a kid. I mean, I can remember be asking my parents to stay up because the first Monday Night Football game was the New York Jets. Which right. I was a Jets fan, and. It was a cultural phenomenon. It was treated like a prime time television yeah. show. It wasn't yeah. just a the football. sports, right? It was a prime time show, which means entertainment. Cosell, Danny Don, entertainment. Eventually, yeah. Alex Harris, entertainment. It's w- way past that stage now. Now it's a football game. It's the Monday football, yeah. but it's a football game. So treat football it. Game. ESPN finally got to the point where they understood it's a football game. So let's get the best football crew out there. Joe Buck and Troy Aikman. And it's been, it's been, it took them too long to get there, but it was by far the smartest move they made. You know what I'm still thinking about right now? I'm thinking about an egg cream. Oh, <laughs> and and, and, and said at the beginning, I'm like, I want to go to Nathan's because I, I, Nathan's hot dogs, Cody, my grandfather used to take my brothers and, and me to Coney Island on weekend summer weekends when we were kids, and man, a Nathan's hot dog. Oh, well, that, yeah, yeah, or even the doll, you know, the the the, the smelly water summertime one dollar hot dogs on the streets of New York, Ted. You yeah. don't have that here. Yeah, but I will tell you this: you, you've heard of a top dog, right? Yeah. In Berkeley, you yeah. covered a lot of Cal games. Yeah, and then there's Casper's. A different kind of it's more like a chicago it's got the steaming and the block well, chicago hot dog is great the chicago style oh hot dog. well you're yeah yeah especially with the I, salt on it. oh the, the, the salt on and the, the sauerkraut well, i like sauerkraut. i'm the only person on the planet that likes sauerkraut i think no i love sauerkraut you like sauerkraut i love sauerkraut yeah i mean again it's a new york kid i think you're secretly ate, I, that's how we ate hot dogs we had hot dogs with sauerkraut i never understood relish on a hot dog until i got to the chicago and saw Chicago style hot dogs. Yeah, and they can't replicate them here. They try. And by the way, you'll agree with me. Do you agree, Ted Robinson, that if you put ketchup on a hot dog, you should be sent to prison? Is that correct? I, I that, that that is that's a felony. It's, there, are, there are misdemeanors in life, but that's a felony. Hot dog, you put ketchup. It's like again. No, yeah, I, I can I go have, on and on. Four, I have four grandkids that I'm sorry. Yeah. Right now, don't, yep. they, they never put a ketchup Kids on do that, yeah. when there's hot dogs. Never. It, yeah. You can put it on eggs. You can do it on the, uh, you know, hash brown. You don't put ketchup on a hot dog. Yes, felony. Maybe even a, anyway, we won't go there. Right, enough of the metaphors. Ted, I could talk to you on and on. I want to tell you something. I really appreciate you taking the time, putting up with my electronic, uh, uh and, oh, Rich, uh, I'm happy, and I hope I hope we can transfer this properly. So that yes, we, that would be nice too, right? It'll be, it'll for sure be on my YouTube page if we can. Uh, well, there we'll you go. For yours. Yeah, well, you you have good taste, Ted. Thank you very much for appearing. My pleasure. Thanks.